from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin tonight with our first look at the man who was injured yesterday in a shootout with San Antonio police. He is 23-year-old Elijah Clemente Gonzalez, a five-year veteran of SAPD, also injured in that shooting. This happened off of I-10 near Calabria and Trinity yesterday, just about 24 hours ago, around 6.30. This started when police responded to a domestic violence call. Officers say Gonzalez threatened his girlfriend, saying he was going to shoot up the place. When Gonzalez saw police, they say he drove off. Police followed. According to SAPD, Gonzalez crashed and jumped out of his car, then tried to carjack someone. A police officer got out of his own vehicle, and Gonzalez reportedly fired at him, hitting him in the forearm. The officer then returned fire, hitting Gonzalez three times, according to SAPD. Gonzalez now in critical condition. He was already wanted on warrants, and now he'll be charged with attempted capital murder, aggravated robbery, and felon in possession of a firearm. Shock and disappointment for the family of a woman who was killed by her ex-husband. David Estrada was facing 99 years to life for running over Domingo Pesqueda in September of 2020. After hours of deliberation, jurors gave him the minimum this afternoon. John Paul Barajas live at the Cadena Reeves Justice Center today. So John Paul, what is that minimum sentence? Myra, 15 years in prison. That was the jury's final verdict. And again, as you mentioned, that was the minimum sentence. The maximum was 99 or life, which is what the Pesqueda family wanted. As the judge read the final verdict, the heir was taken out of the room. The Pesqueda's family gasped and started to cry. And today, as Estrada addressed the courtroom for the last time, he was emotional, as he has been in previous days. He spent most of the day in tears and with his head in his hands and arms. His attorney stated he was remorseful, but that he knows he needs to be punished. While on the stand, Estrada also took us through the night he hit Pesqueda, stating it sparked from an argument that he didn't recall, adding he planned to drive up to her and pull up on the curb in front of his ex-wife to tell her to get in so they could go home. That didn't happen. I was kind of scared. I was... No, we weren't perfect. But I love her. And I'm sorry. For the bottom of my heart, I'm sorry. As he apologized, the family just shook their heads, and after the verdict was read, Pascal's family reminded Estrada of the hurt he's caused them and the life that he took. Again, for being found guilty of murdering his ex-wife, he will be facing, or uh, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Coming up tonight at 10, we'll hear from Pascal's family. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. Among the most directly impacted by the mass shooting at Robb Elementary were the children of Uvalde, those who were injured, others who knew the victims or were related to them. They too are grieving and will be for a long time, which is why the Children's Bereavement Center of South Texas now has a facility in Uvalde. The newly opened Comfort and Consult Center is staffed with licensed grief counselors at no cost. The bereavement center was already working with schools in Uvalde soon after that tragedy. It has been serving grief-stricken children and their families in South Texas for 25 years now, including those at other mass shootings. It's one of several agencies based in San Antonio doing its part to help the Uvalde community. So we're just proud to be one piece of what will hopefully be a long-term journey of healing. They, along with the Ecumenical Center, Family Services, others based in San Antonio, are in partnership with the Uvalde Strong Resiliency Center, which offers several services at its temporary location. Now, come November, it will have a permanent home in downtown Uvalde. The planned school board meeting in Uvalde to determine the fate of District Chief Pete Arredondo tomorrow morning. It's not happening. It's been canceled. The district officials posted a statement on their website saying, quote, in conformity with due process requirements and at the request of his attorney, the meeting to consider the termination of Chief Arredondo will be held at a later date, which has yet to be determined. That statement goes on to say that Arredondo will be on unpaid administrative leave. The next scheduled board meeting is set for Monday at 6 p.m. Intense heat and high prices, two things that we are all feeling right now, but you might not think about the effect on volunteer fire departments. 
The drought and the heat are keeping firefighters working around the clock, and what they need right now is more than a break. It's a bigger budget. Camilia Juanez explains. <laughs> The Volunteer Fire Department is responding to a record number of calls. Lately, it's been overwhelming. For all of last year, it responded to 129 calls. And so far this year, that number is at 331. That's more than we've ever seen in a year period, and we're only about halfway through the year right now. Crews are dealing with house fires, medical emergencies, and mostly grass fires. And because of the wildfire risk, leaders in Atascosa County issued a disaster declaration in March. The temperature, how dry things are, the lack of precipitation, things could get hectic in a matter of minutes. But it's not just in Poteet. The majority of the county is experiencing a high call volume. The Atascosa Fire Marshal says county commissioners budgeted this year using the number of calls it got last year. And that's not enough. Add to that the other things firehouses need to pay for, like replacing equipment and higher gas prices. Everybody's feeling it. Every fire department within the county, uh, outside of our county, outside of our state, is feeling it. At this time, fire departments don't expect to get any more funding from the county this year, so they're relying on donations to hold them over for the rest of the year. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. A family breathing a sigh of relief, yet holding their breath, wondering what comes next after an SUV plowed into their west side home last night. This happened in the 800 block of Kirk Place. A woman inside that house had some bumps and some bruises, but she is going to be okay. As Katrina Weber shows us, the family now has a major mess to clean up. Trouble needed no invitation. It barged right into this home. San Antonio police believe the driver of this SUV was drunk and lost control on Kirk Place near General Hudnell. He took out a light pole, leaving it dangling, then jumped the curb and slammed into the home. I just heard a big boom and I look out my window and I just see my neighbor's house busted open. I don't know what to do. But it didn't take long for Devin Perez to figure it out. The 12 year old called for his mother, then called 911. They were asleep when the crash happened just after three this morning. So was their neighbor, a woman about 20 years old and her baby, both on a couch right near the wall. A family member says she suffered a minor concussion and the baby was slightly bruised. Perez says the driver wasn't sticking around to help. He ran that way. But uh, her brother, he went, stopped her. he went to stop him over there, and he caught him. Police took over from there and arrested the driver on a DWI charge. Once the SUV was out of the way, firefighters and the family tried to shore up the house and board up the hole. Even as bad as the damage was, this is one case where things really could have been a lot worse. If that SUV had hit just a few inches over, it would have taken out the gas line. Still. It was more than enough excitement for Perez. Crazy night for you. Very. <laughs> I'm tired. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police looking for some help tracking down a woman who they say robbed a Victoria's Secret and then threatened to shoot everyone in that store. This happened last month at the store in Ingram Park Mall. Investigators say that this woman walked in and started grabbing merchandise. When someone approached her, police say the woman reached into her bag and threatened to start shooting. Then she grabbed more stuff on her way out. Anyone who knows who this person is could get up to $5,000 from Crime Stoppers. Call 210-224-STOP. Well, they aren't anywhere near what any of us would call low, but gas prices are going down, dropping another eight cents from last week. AAA says the national average for a gallon of unleaded gas, $4.44. Here in Texas, the average price is $3.92 a gallon. Laredo has the cheapest gas right now, 356 there. The most expensive gas can be found in Bryan College Station, $4.06. Here in San Antonio, it's averaging 384, but you can find it for less in some spots. Let's take a look outside with uh, traffic right now, and uh, we've been trying to find some. Really, there are no traffic trouble spots to tell you about uh, during what, I don't even know if we can call it a 6 o'clock commute at this point. It's smooth sailing out there right now. But it might not be all weekend. There's some road construction happening around the city this weekend, and some of that will stretch into next week. Here's Stephen Cavazos with the potential slowdowns you need to watch out for. 
Several closures are still taking place in and around the Alamo City. Now, while we are looking ahead to the weekend, we're also going to get a peek of what's going to be taking place next week. All right, let's go ahead and start. So we know that work continues along Loop 1604 on the northeast side of San Antonio striping work. Now, this did start on Sunday, July 17th, but will be wrapping up according to TxDOT Saturday, July 23rd, 9 in the evening to 5 in the morning. So for those late night owls or early bird commuters, make sure you plan ahead because there'll be various lane closures along Loop 1604 eastbound from the bypass frontage road ramp to Lookout Road. But of course, as I mentioned, we're looking ahead to the next few days. Bridge work will continue to take place next week on Monday, July 25th to Tuesday, July 26, 830 in the evening to 530 in the morning. Full eastbound main lane closure at FM 1518 is what drivers can expect. But we're already looking ahead to, toward August because road work will continue also off Loop 410 on the west side of San Antonio. That did start on Monday, July 18th but according to TxDOT, we'll wrap on Monday, August 1st. Uh, 9 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon is when we can expect that work to take place, so we know that it's going to be a busy time, so make sure that you plan ahead, especially before morning rush gets here. Alternating lane closures on the frontage roads in both directions from Marbach Road to Ingram Road is what drivers can expect. But of course, that information on our website, if you have those phones, make sure you open your camera app right now. Scan the QR code. It's going to take you directly to the KSAT traffic page, and it has all the lists of the closures that are taking place in our area. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Weekend is almost here. It is moments away and everybody's plans trying to stay cool. Justin Horn pretty much. I, you know, we're used to it by now, but these temperatures just keep staying the same. It feels like every day at around 530 we reached 102. So that's our new high, new official high for the day. 79 was the low this morning. The record was 103 set back in 2018, so we came up just short of that. The aquifer stayed steady today. It's at 633.1 in your pollen counts. Just mold. Not too much to worry about at 310. Here's the good news. There is a glimmer of hope next week. We'll explain what that means coming up. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. We're hearing from more people after Uvalde School District says that its police chief is going to remain on the force for now. Now, right now, the focus is on Chief Pete Arredondo, but one state senator says that accountability may only start with Arredondo. We're going to have that story coming up. Also, an update on monkeypox. We know two kids in the U.S. now have the illness. We're going to look at those cases and also tell you what we're seeing here in San Antonio. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. New at 6, as football season gets geared up with summer practices, there is one test you might want to make sure that your student athlete gets now. That's especially the case if your child will be practicing in this extreme heat we've been having. Ursula Perry reports that an EKG now could prevent sudden cardiac arrest later. It's time for football practice, a time to get kids moving. But did you know that there may be a silent condition among student athletes that could put them at risk for sudden death? One in 300 will carry a form of cardiovascular disease that predisposes them uh, to have a risk of sudden cardiac arrest. If not treated properly within minutes, sudden cardiac arrest is fatal in 92% of cases. School physicals are designed to check a student athlete to see if they're fit to play, but... There are studies that show that 90 to 96% of things that are going to kill our kids are missed on that standard physical. So what symptoms should parents look for? Having chest pain, shortness of breath, or becomes dizzy and passes out with exercise. Those are always red flags. But most don't experience any symptoms at all before sudden cardiac arrest. So the best form of prevention is to get your child an EKG screening, which is not included in a standard physical. An EKG enhances detection of forms of cardiovascular disease that uh, can cause sudden cardiac arrest. EKG screening is a very simple uh, cost-effective tests that can save lives. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, every year about 2,000 people die of sudden cardiac arrest who are 25 years old or younger. That's why pediatricians recommend that parents get their children an EKG when they go in for a clinical visit, whether they're an athlete or not. It'll cost you about $200. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
All right, we know it's going to be hot out there this weekend. We're all going to figure out ways to stay cool. But, Justin, mm -hmm. you said something that caught my attention. There's a glimmer of hope somewhere. There is. It's it's small. I don't want to get people's <laughs> hopes up too high. I mean, next week there is a chance. And what we're doing is we're going through these models and just scouring them to find something, something to give us a little bit of hope here. And there is a small chance of rain coming up next week. First, though, we start with the highs today, 102 here in San Antonio, 101 in New Braunfels, 98 Curvo, 101 Honda, 107 in Catula. These numbers look very similar to the past several days, really the past couple months. Our average high is 96, to uh, give you some cons a comparison there. Uh, we are well above average. Uh, July is going to end well above average. Right now we're uh, looking at a 90 degree average temperature that's taking into account highs and lows. And that would put us at the top of the list. And the way things are looking, we should finish that way. So May was the hottest on record. June, the hottest on record. July, likely the hottest on record. What a summer it has been. And let's check in on rainfall really quickly, too. We're way behind there since June 1st. About 64 hundredths of an inch of rain. We're four and a half inches below average. And since the beginning of the year, we have 5.12 inches. That is nearly 13 inches below average. Pretty incredible. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's going to get much, much better. Uh, the departure from normal rainfall as we look across the state, San Antonio has one of the biggest deficits in the state of Texas. So our area has been hit pretty hard with this drought. Now everybody has a deficit except for Brownsville, but we need the rain really desperately here in South Texas. You know that. And so that's why we're looking so hard uh, to see if we can find any chance there. So we look at the time lapse. There were some clouds today. 100 degrees right now. Humidity is at 27 percent. There's a little bit of a heat index right now, but not much. East southeasterly winds at about 11 miles per hour. And thankfully, we do have those breezy winds. We look at the satellite picture and you can see some of those clouds that have popped up this afternoon, none of which have yielded any rain. 98 degrees right now in Boulevardi, 99 in New Braunfels, 100 in Seguin, 101 Gonzales. We're at 102 right now in Pleasanton. And two points have dropped all the way down into the low 60s. Again, that's just enough to get us a little bit of a heat index. And I think two points will look pretty similar over the weekend. Uh, the feels like number 101 at the airport, 101 Port SA, 103 Stinson. So we're tacking on a degree or two for that feels like temperature. UK has had 12 hour forecast 90 by 9 o'clock. It's slow to cool down. If you have evening plans, no, it is still going to be very toasty. And by 80 uh, by midnight, 83 degrees, 81 at 1 a.m., 80 by 2 a.m. And by tomorrow morning, we should fall into the upper 70s. There will be some clouds that move in. And so we'll start off cloudy on on Saturday, but it won't. Those clouds won't last very long. And again, everyone will be right around that 100 degree mark. There's going to be a few spots in the hill country just like today that may not get there. But here in San Antonio, we're forecasting 100 yet again. As we look across the state, there are some showers out around Houston. We've noticed some showers and storms out in West Texas today, but everything's staying away from us. Uh, some decent rains out in parts of New Mexico and far west Texas uh, and temperatures plenty warm up there around Waco 101 there 98 in Dallas. Uh, 86 in Lubbock with some rain there. They've they've kind of lucked out, but uh, 105 in Laredo. And you look at the big picture here. There's a lot of heat to go around. It's not just us. 100 Wichita, 100 St. Louis, and then the normal hot spots, Las Vegas and Phoenix, up above 110 today. Here's the setup. High pressure really uh, taking control of our weather. It has been in control since the beginning of summer. Now it does move a little bit, and this is that glimmer of hope I was speaking of. It moves far enough east that it opens the door for a little disturbance to work in by Wednesday and Thursday. Small chance here. We're talking 10 to 20% chance and it would be really isolated, but it is there. So we've put it in the forecast. 101 Sunday, 102 Monday, 101 Tuesday, and there are those small chances for rain. 10% Wednesday, 20% on Thursday, and just maybe <laughs> that brings us below 100 degrees, Myra. It's something to hope for, right? It is. At this point, any, we'll take anything, That's any right. little change. Thank you, Justin. All right, Andrew Seeley in the studio to talk sports, and we are hearing about Kyler Murray's big new deal. Yeah, he got a huge extension yesterday. He had his first press conference after the contract today, and he was also asked about his future, ironically, in baseball. We'll hear his response about that coming up. Plus, Oscar Cardenas got recognized. Some more preseason honors for the Roadrunners. Got that, too, next. thankful it's a blessing um, for me it's all it's always been about fulfilling my promise um, which is hopefully one day to bring a championship to this organization 
Cardinals quarterback Kyler Murray addressed the media for the first time since signing a huge contract extension, and he knows the kind of pressure that contract brings in big board sports. But first. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. We have yet to get a ruling on quarterback Deshaun Watson's availability this year, but for the time being, he's progressing as if things are normal. Watson reported to the Browns training facility this afternoon. He joins former Texan A.J. McCarron on the Browns training camp roster. McCarron is one of multiple QBs brought in for insurance in case Watson does miss most or all of the season due to a suspension under the NFL's personal conduct policy. Disciplinary officer Sue L. Robinson still has not announced her ruling and there is no timetable for her decision. Even if Watson is suspended from games, he will still be able to practice with the Browns unless Robinson rules otherwise. Cleveland's training camp officially begins next Wednesday, the 27th. Yesterday, Cardinals quarterback Kyler Murray signed one of the wealthiest contract extensions in the league. Five years, $230.5 million with $160 million guaranteed, meaning he'd rake in $46.1 million a year. That's just a half million more than the contract Deshaun Watson signed with the Browns. That seems intentional. Now, before he was drafted by Arizona, Murray had a big choice to make. Enter the NFL or stick with the Oakland A's in Major League Baseball. He was drafted by the Athletics ninth overall in the 2018 MLB draft, but ultimately he chose football instead and was taken first overall in the NFL draft in 2019. Murray was asked about his future in baseball at a press conference this afternoon. Can we uh, put a quash to baseball now? What do you say? Put a squash to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So what? Did you guys see the payroll of the Oakland A's versus his contract? <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. That was Cardinals general manager Steve Keim. The entire active payroll for the Oakland Athletics is $41.9 million. That's $5 million less than Murray's annual value. More preseason recognition for UTSA football. Tight end Oscar Cardenas was named to the John Mackey Awards watch list. He was one of 54 total FBS players on the list for the annual award given to the most outstanding tight end in college football. Cardenas is a San Antonio native who graduated from Brandeis and is a four-year junior now. He also caught one of the most important passes in UTSA history, a game-winning touchdown and a comeback win over UAB in the Alamo Dome that clinched the Conference USA West Division crown. In the majors, objects in the rearview mirror are much closer than they appear. After it looked like the Yankees were going to run away with the American League, the Houston Astros have clawed their way back into contention for the top seed with a sweep of the Yanks in yesterday's doubleheader. Houston has taken five of their seven matchups with New York this season, and they're now just two and a half games behind the Yankees in the AL standings. They are also one of three teams to reach the 60-win total this season. Needless to say, it was a perfect start to the second half of their season. A long day after a short break, but I think the guys did a really good job of um, showing up ready to compete, and I um, was definitely proud of the way we played. I think we did a good job of swinging the bat today. Uh, obviously, not playing for three days. Um, there's a little rust in there, but, you know, we, uh, we get back out there tomorrow and uh, keep going. Just something about this Astros machine that just keeps on churning out wins. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't know too many fans who are upset about that. Yeah, not around, here, not around these parts, that's for sure. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. He is an author who grew up here in San Antonio, and he has a unique perspective to share, which he is doing through a brand new book. Simranjit Singh is the executive director for the Aspen Institute's Religion and Society program and author of that new book, The Light We Give, How Sick Wisdom Can Transform your life. Simran, thanks for being back here on the Q&A. We had you on quite a while ago when you wrote your children's book, but let's talk about this new adventure for you. What is this new book all about? Because in the title, Wisdom That Can Transform Your Life, that's something that's going to grab a lot of people's attention. Yeah, well, you know, the, the book is really, in many ways, it's a memoir. It's a reflection on my own experiences growing up in San Antonio, uh, and looking very different from a lot of the people who are around me with my turban and my beard and my brown skin and dealing with racism as part of our everyday experience. And, and this was very much what life was about growing up in San Antonio. But also, I would want to say that even with the challenges we faced, uh, we were able to find happiness and joy and comfort. And, and part of that is a testament uh, to what San Antonio really is. And part of that is a testament to the philosophy that I embraced uh, that's brought forward uh, by Sikh teachings. And some of that philosophy, I think it's, it's given me calm and peace in a world that's constantly feeling 
difficult and and chaotic and and so it's these teachings that have really helped me that i want to share with other people in, in ways that might help their lives yeah and i'm glad that you brought that up because i feel like that that turmoil and just the weight of of news of headlines of the reality of the world we're living in everybody feels that in some way so if somebody is not familiar with the sick religion but this is your experience growing up in san antonio as you said looking different from a lot of other people how can anyone relate to what's in this book well i think you know growing up i i had all sorts of experiences with racism people would make assumptions about me especially after 9-11. I was a senior in high school uh, at O'Connor High School uh, when 9-11 happened and, and the racism really sharpened. And I had to figure out how to make sense of other people's assumptions about me in ways that didn't really feel uh, true, in, in ways that were different from how I saw myself. And to bridge that gap and to really have confidence in who I was, uh, I, I had to figure out what is, what is my true understanding of the world and how do I find the light within myself and in the people around me? And so I didn't have an option, I don't think. I mean, I guess the only other option that we have in this country right now is to feel angry and bitter and frustrated, which, which so many of us do all the time. And some of the basic teachings that Sikh wisdom have to offer us, like how do you fight hate with love? Or how do you really love your neighbor even when your neighbor doesn't love you? These are some of the experiences that I grew up learning just just by just by my lived experience in San Antonio. And I think those are the kinds of questions all of us are asking ourselves today. Yeah, absolutely. Why, why do you think now was the time for you to write this? Well, I've been wanting to write uh, this book for a long time, but I think it feels especially um, timely given given where we are as a society. I mean, I've had so many people already, the book has been out for three days, and so many people have been coming up to me and saying, you know, this is this is the piece that I need in a world that just feels like it's constantly hitting us over the head with bad news. And, you know, for me, at least, I felt the same way that for for years now, every day I wake up and think, OK, now things will change. Now the, the world will get easier. Now all the difficulties will slow down and they just haven't. It's felt incessant and it feels like a lot of pressure. And I think something that we all need to figure out is how do we have calm while we're in the storm? because the world will continue to be hard and each of us will continue to face our challenges. And so developing practices and ways of viewing ourselves and one another so that we don't always feel so negative and hopeless. I think that's what we need in this moment right now. And that's, that's what I'm trying to offer through this book. It sounds like there are, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it sounds like there are a lot of big topics that you address in this book and trying to help people navigate what is a really weighty time in the world. You went from writing a children's book to this. So that, that sounds like an interesting transition or was it easier than someone may guess? Well, you know, what's, what's interesting and, and, you know, I could say a few different things about this, but what's really interesting is that some of the greatest and most profound wisdom is actually really simple. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of the teachings that, that I've learned and that I try to practice, these are not new ideas. I mean, they might be new in terms of a shift in perspective, but some of the ideas here are things we already know in our hearts and we're just not sure how to put them into practice, right? How do we really see one another with the dignity we all share. The, the title of this book is The Light We Give. And there's a metaphor of light in here. And many of our spiritual traditions teach us that we all are filled with the same light. I mean, kids can understand that. My young daughters understand that. And so taking the most simple ideas as we do in children's literature, as we do when we're kids and learning how to apply them in our lives so that we are constantly feeling proud of how we're behaving in this world. I think that's really, it's, it's really subtle, it's really simple, but it's a profound shift from how we, how we behave on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's, I think there's a really nice connection there in terms of how, we're, how we can learn to be. We were just showing the image of your children's book, Fauja Singh Keeps Going. And you know, I'm, I'm standing here nodding, thinking about the books I read my kids at night and some of those simple messages that I think, I wish more adults read this book, right? I wish more adults were getting this message. Before we let you go, let's talk about where people can get this new book, The Light We Give. 
Oh, the book the book is from Penguin Random House, so it's available everywhere books are sold. Um, in San Antonio, The Twig, Nowhere Bookshop, the independent stores, uh, go for those if you can. Uh, but truly, if anybody who's willing to, to look into it and, and get a copy and read it or listen to it, uh, I'd be grateful. And I really hope that it is uh, helping you find happiness in your own life. Simran Jeet Singh, author, someone from right here in San Antonio. Uh, the Light We Give, it is out now. Thank you so much for sharing some time with us here today. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back. The San Antonio Humane Society is looking for help emptying their shelters, and they're hoping that sale prices on adoptions will entice people to adopt a dog or a cat. The adoption fees for dogs and cats is $25. Now that excludes puppies and kittens under one year. The regular adoption process and screening still applies. You can visit their website to see all the available dogs and cats. The emptying the shelter sale ends at the end of the month. Animals, us, we are all feeling it. It is just so hot out there, and this camera also looks a little dirty because, you know, <laughs> no rain. Nothing, just some dust in there. And speaking of animals, you got to be careful with those two as you take them out for walks. You want to do it in the evenings because the pavement gets so terribly hot. Highs today, 102 here in San Antonio. New Braunfels got up to 101, Seguin 100. Bernie stage, 95 degrees. It's another blazing hot day. And as we look across the state of Texas, it's hot just about anywhere you go. 101 in San Angelo, 101 at Waco, 98 in Dallas. Not as hot up across North Texas. And they've actually seen some rain there over uh, the last several hours. No rain here, but could we see a little bit next week? We'll take a look, coming up. There was a bit of a buzz in the UK over Wendy of the burger chain, Wendy's. She's got a new look. Gone are her trademark red pigtails for what the brand is calling a flowing emo fringe. The location is in the hip Camden area of London. The logo is a nod to the area well known for music and fashion. Emo Wendy, as she is called, was originally part of a Camden Street mural, but now adorns the restaurant's exterior, along with another new look known as Punk Wendy. Last year, Wendy's returned to the UK for the first time in over 20 years. The Camden location is the eighth outlet to open up there. Emo Wendy. All right, so you've heard of CEOs, COOs, CFOs. How about this one? CCO, that is the chief candy officer. Apparently it is a real gig, or it will be at a Canadian candy company. Candy Funhouse, an online candy company, says it's willing to pay someone $100,000 for that gig. Candidates need to be at least five years old. The company says the person they pick will be put through extensive palate training. The job description includes taste testing more than 3,500 products every month, approving what kind of candy the company sells. And strategy and candy board meetings are a must. Anyone know anyone? Any takers? I do. Pretty sure I live with one. Mangoes are in season, but we're going to distill all that mango mania into one day. Today is National Mango Day. The yellow fruit was first cultivated more than 4,000 years ago in India. Well, now there are more than 500 varieties all across the world and probably just as many ways to eat them or drink them. From mango margaritas to salads, salsa, seafood dishes. They all have plenty of nutrients to offer with one mango containing nearly two and a half times more vitamin C than an orange. National Mango Day started in India, but the National Mango Board decided to get in on it here as well. I had no idea there was a National Mango Board. Didn't either. But let's and, talk about that candy gig. Well, I mean, I, it sounds great until all your teeth fall out. <laughs> It seems like that, that would be a for sure thing. Did you see how much candy you had to taste test? Said like a dad, right? It's true. It's true. I give my kids one piece of candy and it's it's all over with. <laughs> it's, you know, they're running everywhere. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, that's how it goes. I bet it gets filled pretty quickly, though. Uh, let's talk about the drought situation we have underway. I want to take you out to Amistad. We got some details today here. We we're looking at the, the lake levels out there. Of course, this is out near Del Rio. And it's not good. Uh, the latest shows that it's 33% full, down 62 feet, down 14 feet in one year. But the catch here is this is the lowest level since the initial inundation in the 1970s. 
So we're reaching some record levels here, and we desperately, desperately need that rain. 100 degree days this year, 43 now we add to the list. And we're working our way up to that second and first place. Uh, 2011, we had 57, 2009, 59. We are certainly on pace to beat those two if things continue as they are. 102, the high today, 101 in Hondo. We did stay below 100 in Kerrville and Rock Springs, but those were one of the few spots because everyone else was looking at these uh, triple digits. 101 Gonzalez uh, was 102 out there in Del Rio. And right now, still hot. We're looking at 100 degrees. There are a few clouds. Dew point is at 60, just enough to give us that heat index of 101 with an east southeasterly breeze at about 11 miles per hour. Temperatures are still holding on to the triple digits. Uh, we're still seeing those triple digits. Hondo to U Valley. Creosote Springs 106 right now in Catula. It'll take some time for these numbers to come down, so it's going to be a, a very toasty evening, especially with those, those winds. That'll keep temperatures up overnight, and, and if we see some clouds moving in by tomorrow morning, which I think we will, that'll keep temperatures up too. Uh, 93 right now, Bernie Stage, 95 Comfort, 99 right now in New Braunfels. And speaking of those winds, we're seeing some gusts anywhere from 20 to 25. So there's a little breezy out there. These winds continue the next couple days. You can see some gusts 20, 25 miles per hour, I think, tomorrow and again on Sunday, too. So just adds up. It's that southerly breeze, and it is uh, pumping in some moisture to create that heat index. 103 is what it feels like at Stinson. 103 Hondo, 102 Rio Medina, and we'll be in this range again tomorrow with the heat indices somewhere around 100, 204 by the afternoon. It's not a lot of fun to be outside. Uh, tonight, temperatures do fall into the upper 70s, partly cloudy and windy. And the heat index forecast tomorrow, as I mentioned, we get up to about 100, but the heat index will be around 104. So that's that's the catch. There is enough moisture there for that to happen. And that's and not necessarily danger level, but you got to be careful. And we've been dealing with this all summer, so we're kind of used to it. If you're heading down to the beach, here's a forecast for you. It looks pretty good. I mean, the heat index down there along the coast is going to be anywhere from 107 to 109 because humidity is so thick. Bays are choppy. Seas anywhere from two to three feet, two to four feet on Sunday. And the water temperature is plenty warm in the 80s, even close to 90 in some cases. So let's look down the line here. High pressure has been very much in control. You see the heat advisories that have been posted for much of the country. It continues to bring in a lot of heat around the edges. You are getting some showers and storms, just not here. This high starts to move east as we get into the weekend. So Sunday, a little closer to us. Temperatures a little bit warmer. That's the case on Monday, too. But by Tuesday and Wednesday, and maybe more so Thursday, it moves far enough east to where it kind of opens the door a little bit. If we can get a disturbance coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, there may be enough moisture there to get an isolated shower or storm going. It's not much. It's not a great chance, but it is there. We want to pass that along because we are looking and searching for any kind of hope here when it comes to rain. 100 tomorrow, some clouds in the morning. That'll be the case on Sunday too. 101 on Sunday, 102 Monday, 101 Tuesday, and then some very small chances of rain there Wednesday and Thursday. Still nothing significant, so this drought continues, Myra. Mm -hmm. At least it's somewhere on the seven day. True, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, Justin. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Friday, July 22nd. Happy Friday. Trouble needed no invitation. It barged right into this home. San Antonio police believe the driver of this SUV was drunk and lost control on Kirk Place near General Hudnell. He took out a light pole, leaving it dangling, then jumped the curb and slammed into the home. San Antonio police investigating a shooting that left a woman and her two-year-old child injured. It happened last night around 1030 in the 800 block of Timlow Drive. That's near Gimbler Road and AT&T Parkway. Officers say people were gathered in front of a home after a funeral when someone in a black SUV drove up and started firing. A 26-year-old woman and her two-year-old were hit in the leg. The Evaldi CISD school board meeting that is scheduled for tomorrow morning will not happen after all. That meeting was set to determine Chief Pete Arirando's fate. It's been canceled. The Uvalde Together Resiliency Center had to make the best of its temporary location. Come November, it'll have a permanent home for its myriad of services. Yet even here and through its outreach, it's helped some 2,200 people, most of them 
or counseling. New this afternoon, a federal jury has found Steve Bannon guilty of contempt of Congress. Those charges stem from his refusal to testify before the January 6th House Committee. The White House says it's business as usual for President Biden as he battles COVID-19 in isolation. Seen here in this new photo, masked up and on the phone with his national security team today. Welcome back. Uh, temperatures have just dropped to 98 degrees, so this is exciting. We're down below 100 now. We'll, down, we'll get down to 78 by tomorrow morning, but another day in the triple digits tomorrow. Keep in mind, that feels like temperature is going to be anywhere from 100 to 104. That'll be the case both Saturday and Sunday with some morning clouds. Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, still hot. Uh, there is that outside chance of a shower, maybe a thunderstorm as we get into Thursday. Chances aren't great. I don't want to get everyone's hopes too high but at least it's a little bit of a pattern change and hopefully we can get a few showers in here, probably developing along the coast and then working their way a little bit closer to San Antonio during the afternoons. And that could, if we get enough cloud cover, keep us below 100. We'll keep our fingers crossed because every day this month, 100 or above, uh, except for one. That's it. Fingers are crossed. Thanks, Justin, and thank you for watching.